Welcome to church. Welcome to Willsborough Baptist Church. Uh, coming to you from our living room. Uh, we love to be with you. We love to gather with you, even though we can't do so face to face. And we're so glad that you've connected in here. In fact, we're, we're honoured that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, um, wherever you're from. Uh, and um, we hope you feel very welcome, especially welcomed by Jackson and his friends. Jackson being our, our dog, we know he seems to get quite a lot of attention um, and, uh, and uh, currently is just a sleepover on the floor the other side of the room. But I'm sure we'll be making a bit of an appearance later on. Um, please, we'd love you to get in contact with us. So we have a, a number up in the corner of the screen. Um, we you know, we want to feel connected as a church family. And also, um, we want to know what God's placing on your heart today. So it, what is God saying to you? Um, what verses is he speaking to you? Are there some testimonies of what he's been doing in your life or a particular prayer that you just want to lift up as part of the service? Obviously, when we're together, we can all use our spiritual gifts, but we want the same to be true even when we're connected online. So please do get in touch with the text number. Um, and in fact, um, we've already got a message in today and I wanted just to share this up front. Um, it's Isaiah 40 verse 31. And maybe this is really pertinent to you this morning as you, um, as you prepare your heart to, um, to worship. And it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And actually it says here, follow up, it says, an eagle uses the eye of the storm to allow itself to be lifted up. In the midst of the storms of life, believers like eagles need to allow the Holy Spirit to lift them up so that they can, from a heavenly perspective, um, they can see and act according to God's perfect will. What an encouragement. Thank you for uh, messaging that in. Um, and as I say, maybe that's for you this morning in whatever you're going through. We want to say a huge thank you to those who came along to the well yesterday and we had Skies play for us. It was a wonderful morning. Thanks so much to Jez and Ali um, for joining us. And actually, we've kind of kidnapped Alad the Penguin here. So he's making a bit of a guest um, appearance today on the live stream, uh, but we will return him shortly. Uh, but it was great that we had over 60 people there. In fact, do you know, since the well's been open, there, we've served over 250 customers and we've only been open sort of eight mornings. So thank you. Um, to all those who've supported the well, who've been praying for it, um, who've been volunteering. It's been, um, it's been amazing. It's been such a blessing. And um, we pray that it will continue to be a real blessing to our community and a space where people can encounter God's presence um, among his people and be refreshed and, um, and experience his healing and his joy and his peace. Um, and also, we want to just remind you that this Thursday evening at eight o'clock is the whole church prayer meeting. Um, we really want to encourage you to gather together. We had an amazing Churches Together prayer meeting on Friday. You know, there was sort of between 100 and 150 people turned up. So thank you if that, uh, that was you. Um, if you missed out on that, please gather uh, as a whole church this Thursday at 8. We really want to um, come together and be seeking the Lord at this time. And we feel that these meetings that we have are some of the most significant meetings that we have as a church. Um, they, are some of the, they are prophetic moments where God speaks. And so please do uh, connect in with that. Um, and also... Uh, we have a worship playlist, uh, finally, that's up on YouTube for you. So if you've been connecting in with the live streams and you've been thinking, well, I don't know necessarily all of the songs or, or maybe you want to just be listening to some more of the songs that we've been putting up there. Um, I, I was joking before the service, you can listen to these anyway. If you're working from home, um, if you're relaxing, if you're in the bath, wherever, it's great. YouTube playlist, go on to that and listen to some of the worship songs and um, and. 
maybe just as a means to help you in your personal devotional life. Um, that's on the YouTube channel. So I'm sure you'll be able to find that. Um, but this morning, um, we're really pleased to be joined by Barry and Shona. Um, Barry's going to be leading us in worship. So, uh, so Barry, uh, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I was considering things last night and we've got a great God. Our God has been so faithful to us all. Um, you know, even, even things like, like the well, you know, as a church, we believe that was something that we should be stepping out. We've always said we should be a community church. We stepped out into that. And God is, God is, God is sending people our way because of it. He is being faithful. Um, so we come this morning, and we come this morning to, to praise. We come to, to worship. And why do we do that? Well, in Psalms it says, Come, let us shout praises to God. Let's raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let's march into his presence singing praises, lifting the rafters with our hymns. And why? Because God is a great God. King over all gods. In one hand, he, he, he holds deep caves and caverns. In the other hand, he grasps the high mountains. He made the oceans. He owns them. His hands sculpt the earth. So come, let us worship. Let us bow down before him. On your knees before God. The God who made us. One of the benefits of, of being at home in church, as we do, is you haven't got 150 people around you, so you can do what you want to do. So maybe this morning we do need to get onto our knees. Maybe this morning we do need to bow down before our God. He gave us everything. He gave us our breath in our lungs. That's why we need to praise him. Father, as we come to you now, we just want to say thank you. We just want to say thank you for everything you've given us, for how faithful you are, for the gifts you give us, for the life you give us. So Father, just take Take this, this, take this time as our, as our praise, as our worship, as our, our song of love to you. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Yes, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out 
out our prayers to you only. You give life, you are love. Bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, yes, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you all. joy to honor you in all I do I honor you when I'm forgiven because you were forsaken when I'm accepted you were condemned when I am alive and well, the Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, 
love I know it's true now it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you when I am forgiven because you were forsaken I am accepted you were condemned when I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love That you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. Now it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. What a faithful God we have. God that sent his son to die for us. A God that promised that we would have Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help us. Jesus is an example. The Holy Spirit to walk with us on a daily basis. And I just think it came to me this morning that maybe there are some people watching this this morning who have had a faith who years ago have possibly made a commitment to God have said yes Lord but haven't maybe have drifted away our God is a faithful God and and has been faithful all the way through those years and is there close by just waiting we may have walked away we may have done other stuff we may have felt like we've been a long way away but God has always been there he is a faithful God and he's just waiting for us to come home All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Maybe will you just take this song as a prayer? say thank you Lord thank you that you have been faithful everything that I've been through Lord you've been with me I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life 
you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Thank you. Thank you that you are so faithful. Thank you that you walk with us on a daily basis. Thank you that we can trust in you. No matter where our life takes us. No matter if we walk away. You want us to come back. Father, our prayer today, as it says in that bridge, with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Amen. 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 And we've had some... uh messages in some texts just as um as we were praising god there and just people echoing that um 
yeah, that phrase, I guess, resonating round throughout homes um, of people connecting in. Um, this one says, with every breath I take, with every step I make, I offer up my life to you. The sacrifice I make cannot compare with the sacrifice you made for me. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Amen. Um, this one says, come breathe life into dry bones, Lord. And then these um, words from Ezekiel 37 It says, he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. What a wonderful, humble reply. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You know, maybe that's a word for people watching today that God will put breath into you and he will give you life because he is the sovereign Lord. And maybe that's also a word for our town as we look out upon our town that we see that God is the one who breathes breath into people and who brings everything to life and causes the dry bones um, to come to life and to flourish in him. Um, So many more messages and verses. um, You know, Romans 8 verse 1, um, which we will be mentioning later on, but says, there's now, therefore now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus, those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You know, and it says, praise be to God for his faithfulness and his justice. And then finally, this message just came in um, uh, from Zephaniah 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, our God's so good. You know, he sings over his people. He sings over us. I just love the fact that there's been so many verses just flooding in um, today. And just a, just a reminder as well as we, as we worship this morning, if you have children with you in your household, and we have, um, we have Lighthouse Online for children up to the age of 11. So, you know, whether they connect in now or maybe later in the day and you do that as a family, there's some great um, Bible teaching as well and, um, and games and, and different things so you can engage the family in that, in that important discipleship of your children. Um, but, um, but wonderful. Keep messaging in. The, uh, to the number if you feel God's laying things on your heart for us this morning and we'll try and feed those in. Um, but you're probably aware by now we're doing a new series called Big Questions and we're looking at big questions about life, God, the church, the universe, anything really and looking at them of course from a biblical perspective and so um, we've been encouraging people to send in their questions and uh, thank you to those of you that have. If you haven't done that yet please do. And especially ask, um, you know, if you've got friends who aren't Christians, who aren't believers or maybe agnostic or unsure, um, then ask them what are their questions and let us know and, um, and we will endeavour to answer them the best we can. Today's question is a bit more tricky. You know, last week we looked at heaven. This week... Um, we are going to look at this tricky question of hell, so, um, so do be prepared and now's the time to grab your Bible as well so you can be looking at the verses we'll be referring to. But we're just going to play a, um, a short intro first and um, as we come to God's word this morning. What is your big question? What is my purpose? Does science disprove the Bible? Who is God? Why does God allow evil to happen? Why are Christians so judgmental? Where do we go when we die? Does God care about how I vote? What happens when I die? What's your big question? So would a loving God really send people to hell? What a, what a question. And, um, and as I say, this question's come up a number of times in similar ways, really. And rather than dodge it and pretend that it hadn't been asked, we thought we'd better answer it. Because, yeah, actually, surprisingly enough, Jesus speaks about hell. 
And, and of course, the Bible speaks about hell. And so this is an important question. And, and it is a big one. And having looked last week at heaven and this glorious uh, new creation that is coming, that, that bursts through, if you like, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that is now at work in those who put their faith in Jesus. You know, you're a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Hallelujah. And that will one day reach its fulfillment and its climax when everything will be made new and we will be uninhibited in the fullness of God's presence, you know, made like him. You know, having looked at this wonderful reality that's coming, we then need to look at this alternative. You know, this, this other place, this place of darkness and despair and judgment. And, you know, it might seem so at odds with everything that we looked at last week. And perhaps it might seem so at odds with what we think of, of God and who he is and what he's like. Or perhaps not actually, depending on where you're coming from. But whatever... We think about hell and judgment. Hopefully today will be helpful and actually even an encouragement. So do stay tuned. Don't don't switch off. It's really interesting. Someone um someone just came round and they they asked for directions and um and then rung the doorbell. Hence there was a bit of commotion here. I don't know whether that's a prophetic thing that there are people here who really need direction. You know who are really seeking the way. And they're asking for directions and you're not sure yet which way to turn. And hopefully today, you know, that you'll, you will hear from God and you'll know the direction that you should be walking in. And maybe it's a direction you've already set off on, uh, but God's going to confirm it today. It might surprise you, but the person who speaks about hell more than anyone else in the whole Bible is Jesus. Okay, and, and so we have to really take this seriously. But perhaps even more uncomfortably, look at who he was addressing very often when he spoke about hell. It was the religious people. It was those people who thought they had it all together. It was the people who thought that they were sorted, that everyone else was the problem. The Pharisees and scribes, these religious leaders who were often, not always, but they were often self-righteous and considered themselves superior to everybody else. To those outside... And those whose society looked down on and were perhaps rejected, to those who were painfully aware, if you like, of their own unrighteousness, Jesus spoke about the love and the grace and the mercy of God more often than not. And that is a generalisation. You know, I'm not saying that the topic of hell is not universally relevant and that Jesus didn't actually speak about it to everybody because he did. But what I am saying is Jesus never used hell to scare anyone into religion. That was not what Jesus came to do. In fact, if anything, he used hell to scare people out of self-righteousness, out of self-confidence and dead religion. He spoke about hell actually to those who didn't want to know him. You know, maybe those who were angered by him, who thought they were fine without Jesus and everyone else was the problem. And there are people like this today in the church And in every other arena of life. And there are some hard hitting truths that Jesus would want to get across to those people. You know, that's why he speaks about hell. And remember, Jesus in his ministry was never trying to win a popularity contest. You know, he he, he really could have played that game. He performed some amazing miracles. He fed 5,000 people. I mean, you know, if you want to be popular, then, then, you know, that, that, that sort of thing is definitely going to get you a name for yourself. He had countless opportunities to do this and and he clearly had the charisma but instead Jesus chose the cross but the thing is in many ways when it comes to hell we're we're all in the same boat we all know hell all too well actually you know we all know those things that try and get their claws into us and drag us down into the depths we all know what despair is like we all know deep torment you know, some of us know it in a deeper way and more vivid and, and horrifying way than others. And there are so many things that are not right with the world. In, in fact, there are things that are so wrong, you know, that are so twisted and distorted in our world. We cannot even um, imagine them or bear to think about them half the time. And, and when we do think about these things, it churns us up inside. You know, just pick up a newspaper and you'll see. You, you'll see what hell is like. You know, think about the unthinkable, exploitative, abusive situations that some people endure, sometimes for a lifetime. You know, there are 40 million people today in our world who are in modern slavery. 
There are countries with oppressive regimes. There's violence and terrorism in our world. There's the horrors of war. You know, think about the situation in Yemen. There's, there's terminal illnesses. There's debilitating anxiety, chronic loneliness, broken relationships, injustice. There are battles that rage inside of people, all of us at times. Addictions, self-hatred. This is hell on earth. You know, maybe you've heard someone say before, I am living through hell. And maybe you're one of those people. You know, hell is not just something in the future. You know, it's not just something at the end of all things. It's not some place down there in the depths. Hell is this living torment, this disconnected, disjointed existence that starts now, uh, that is here already. And if it's not nipped in the bud and dealt with, that will grow and fully flower into eternity with horrific consequences. But, you know, we all know hell is what I'm saying. We all know hell now in some way. And Jesus says, we don't have to stay there. We don't have to be stuck in it. There is a verse in Psalm verse 40 that says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Hallelujah. Do you know, if you're in the pit of despair today, if you're in that miry clay, if you feel like you're just wading through treacle, Jesus can lift you out of it and set you on solid ground. You know, last week we looked at the, the grand narrative of the Bible. We, um, we looked at Genesis. We looked at the origins of evil and sin in the world. There's still some questions around that you might want to ask, and, and please do. We looked at how humanity turned from God, you know, and, and having turned from him, that this rift was opened up between God's space and ours, if you like, heaven and earth. How, how heaven was meant to be a place on earth. You know, how earth was the place where God intended to be present with us. And yet, when evil came knocking at our door, we opened the front door and welcomed it in. And sin and evil and death have wreaked havoc in the world ever since. I heard it put like this by a preacher, Glenn Scrivener, um, it, He puts it brilliantly. He says, God is a God of light and love and life. He's a God of light and love and life. And when we turn from him and we turn away from the light, we were left in darkness. When we turn away from his love, we were left with disconnection and despair and disorder. You know, when we turn from life, we were left with death. And Jesus came to rescue us from darkness and darkness disconnection and despair and disorder and death itself from this hellish experience. But before we get to that, you know, let's not rush there too quickly because there's a big issue that we need to address in all this and that's God's anger. And, you know, that can seem strange to us because if God is love, how can he be angry with us? That's what some people think. You know, we don't equate anger with love, particularly if it seems that anger might be directed towards us. But you see, we shouldn't see a juxtaposition between God's love and his anger. God's great love for humanity means he is most certainly angry about sin. It destroys lives. It it drags us away from God. It, It denies us of this life God's intended for us. And you know what? Sin causes us to live a kind of a subhuman, dulled existence. You know, imagine the person that you love most in the whole wide world. Whoever that is, it might be, um, you know, it might be your, your spouse, it might be your parents, it might be, a, a, you know, your children. But just imagine that person. And now imagine someone is, is seeking to cause them great harm and is, and is doing that. Does that make you angry? I, I sure hope it does. You know, if you think about the atrocities we described um, that, are, that are at work in the world earlier, a good and loving God must be angry about those things or he's not good and loving. You know, perhaps the example of a parent and child is helpful to you. You know, just because a parent gets angry at their children doesn't mean he doesn't love them. In fact, sometimes their love for their children is precisely why they get angry. Uh, some of you might have listened to the Zonecast, our, our church podcast. I recently interviewed um, Phil, a Baptist minister and friend, and he said God is not the kind of God who's going to just turn a blind eye to our sin or, or even turn and give us a bit of a wink about it. You know, that's not what God's like. God knows what sin does to us. He knows the damage it does to our souls. 
And just think how quickly, you know, you might know someone who's been through this. You might have been through this yourself. But how someone can change completely, almost overnight. You know, maybe because of something that's been done to them or that's happened or something they've done. You know, maybe because of an unhealthy relationship or perhaps a circle of relationships they fall into that's unhealthy. A powerful influence, an addiction. You know, this is, this is evil at work in the world and it can, it can distort us and change us. And that can be all of a sudden or it can be bit by bit. It can be death by a thousand cuts. You know, and that's what sin's like. And God doesn't want that for us. So last week, we looked at what heaven is like. And as I said, we said it was God's space and it was glorious and beautiful. And hell is sometimes referred to as outer darkness. It's this final separation from God. And, you know, with that, all that is good and all that is lovely and all that is life-giving and all the wonderful things that we can experience now in the world, if you think about all those things, in this place, there is not a shred of that goodness left. And it's a terrifying thought. We, we spoke of heaven being a banquet last week. Um, we spoke of it being like a party and God loves parties. And Jesus, we see in the Gospels, he spent a lot of time at them. He got a, he got a bad reputation with the religious leaders for it. Um, you know, there they are again. And Jesus played on this, if you like. And he spoke of hell as being like those who were shut out of the feast. And he was clearly having a go once again at these religious teachers. In Matthew 22, he speaks of weeping and gnashing of teeth, this agonizing existence. And it's kind of like, if you like, the extrapolation of our decision to live our lives without God and to refuse him and even willfully oppose him. It's that continued on to infinity and into eternity. If it helps you, um, N.T. Wright, you know, we were talking about directions earlier. He describes these two directions that people can go in. So he says, on one hand, we can choose Jesus, right? We can be transformed into the people we were created to be and we can become like him. You know, those worst parts of us, uh, the darkness, the pain, the unforgiveness and resentment within us, they can be dealt with. It's glorious. They can be healed. They can even be turned into something beautiful. And, and what this is about, is about becoming truly human. You know, humanity created in the image of God and recreated, if you like, in Jesus Christ. But there is another way. There is the opposite direction. We can see Jesus. We can see that life that he offers and we can choose to say, no, actually, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going my own way. I'm going a different way. I'm going in the other direction. And we can go in that direction until there's nothing left of the image of God in which we were created. We can go in that direction until there's no humanity left. In fact, it's this inhumane existence that Jesus describes as this gnashing of teeth, this snarling, you know, and it can be that going on for eternity. And that's a horrifying thought. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others, but you're still distinct from it. You may even criticise it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticise the mood or even to enjoy it. But just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. It's not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. You know, that's a horrifying thought. You know, the theology there isn't perfect, but you get what he's saying, don't you? And, and you know, James, one of the writers in the New Testament, he puts it like this in James chapter 1, um, verse 13. He says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully growing, gives birth to death. You see, God wants to bring heaven um, fully on earth. Just a second, get my slides right. He wants to bring heaven fully on earth. But first he needs to get the hell out of earth. You know, hell will be cast out. Um, I, I, this diagram 
I think is really helpful in demonstrating what many believe and what the Bible actually teaches. You know, evil will be judged once and for all. And this is not only necessary, it's actually a good thing. It has to be dealt with. That's why Jesus came. And the beautiful thing is God desires none should perish. You know, he didn't come into the world to judge it, but he came to save it. So judgment will come. Um, but before that, God also wants to get the hell, not only out of creation, as you can see in this gospel story, so that heaven can come down. He wants to get the hell out of us so that heaven can, the kingdom of heaven can come in our lives and so that we can become part of the new creation. So the question becomes, will we let him do this? Will we let him do this in our lives? Will we surrender our lives to this king who promises to heal and restore us, who wants the best for us, who will uproot the seeds of hell that have been sown in us, those parts of our lives that we are ashamed of, those parts of us that we try and keep hidden? And, and will we allow him to plant the seeds of life and new creation that will grow in us and into eternity? You see, the problem is, if I was to enter into the new creation now, you know, put it this way, if, if I was to go there right now as I am, into what you might call heaven, I could single-handedly ruin it for everyone, potentially. You know, my selfishness that's still there, my pride, my insecurities, I could project those onto everything. And there are things in me that still need to be dealt with before I can enter that place. But Jesus promises to complete the work he's begun in me, to, to complete the work he's begun in you if you're trusting in him. And, and he promises to welcome us in. So we don't need to worry. You know, I'm forgiven. I've been set free. You know, as we looked at earlier, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But God does need to do something about my sin and yours. And that's why Jesus came. You know, so often people come searching for answers and we've been looking at some of these questions and they want to know answers about everything that's wrong with the world and that is so right and these things matter but then often God's reply is to lovingly and piercingly shine a light into our hearts at all of the things that are wrong with us and show us that actually in some ways we are complicit with this we are not without guilt and then rather than condemn us what does God do he offers us forgiveness and grace and new life in him. He invites us to repent and trust in Jesus and be part of the solution, not the problem. So what I really want to say to you this morning, if you think that it's narrow-minded to say that Jesus is the way, he's the only way, well, actually, you know, you need to know Jesus is the king. You know, when we looked at heaven, Jesus is the one on the throne. Jesus is the one who rules over the universe. And so maybe you need a bigger view of Jesus. Jesus is eternal life. Jesus is freedom. Jesus is peace. He is joy. He is salvation. And so we need to be connected into him, into life itself. And this King Jesus, he took hell upon himself. He went through hell for us. Our torment, our suffering, our darkness. You know, it's like the judge, he came off the judgment seat. He went into the dock and he took upon himself the ultimate sentence and paid the price and went to hell and back so that ultimately we don't have to ever go there. You know, so we don't have to continue on that track so that we can turn around and follow him. Every sin, every sin was laid on him. His blood was shed on the cross and it breaks the power of sin and death in our lives. And so that means we need to repent you know, if you're wondering, where do I go with this? It means we need to recognize there's a problem and uncomfortably and inconveniently enough, the problem turns out to be us some of the time. And, you know, others may not see it, but deep down we know it's true because we know our inmost thoughts. But the thing is, we don't have to live in guilt and secret shame, but we can be set free through faith in Jesus. In fact, Jesus says this. He says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. You know, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. You know, you'll be set free from the chains of hell and self-torment, from guilt and shame. You know, Romans 8 verse 1, as we said, says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, so as we, as we close this morning, 
I want to just take you to a familiar story, uh, to a parable that we looked at earlier in the year in Luke 15. The lost son, the prodigal son, you might know the story. And you know, there's this glorious truth. The younger son shows us no matter how far we've gone, no matter what we've done, um, you know, no matter how many years we've wasted, we're always welcome home. You know, Barry spoke about this earlier. Maybe some of us have just turned away and we've been, we've been going our own way for so long. But actually, Jesus can show us the way back home. And God's that father who runs towards us with open arms to embrace us, no matter the state we find ourselves in. It doesn't matter. You know, if we've been in the pigsty, he'll still throw his arms around us and kiss us. Now, heaven is a welcome for anyone who's been in the pit. And there's an amazing party when you come home and you trust in Jesus. But there's an elder son in this story and he shows us something that is darker and more sinister, perhaps, than you've ever thought when you've read this, because he stays outside. The elder son stays outside. He can't bear what's happened. He can't stand the forgiveness the father's shown to his younger brother. And he puts himself out of fellowship with the father and his brother as a result. He is in hell. He is outside of the banquet and he is in outer darkness. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is he in hell because God is too cruel? No, he's in hell because God's too kind. God is too forgiving. God's too loving. Is he in hell because God has shut him out? No, God is saying, please come inside. Please come into the party. Please come and celebrate with us what's happened. Please don't remain here. But he is in hell all the same. Is he in hell because he's not good enough? No, as far as he's concerned, he's too good. He's too good for heaven. You know, God and his younger brother, they are the hypocrites, not him. And he can't stand to be in their presence. Is he in hell because he's been sent there? No, it's because he's chosen it. He's determined his path. And in fact, he can't bear this father. He hates him. He wants nothing to do with him. And the father is still trying to win him round. He's still pursuing him. He's still pleading with him. And the story is left hanging at the end. But he doesn't come in yet. There's still time. But we don't see the resolution. So would a loving God really send people to hell? Actually, what I want to say is he would rescue each of us out of it in a heartbeat. That's the, that's the answer. He would rescue us out of it just like that. But sadly, some will still choose it anyway. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote a fictional story called The Great Divorce where he says the gates of hell are locked from the inside. You know, and that is, I think, you know, really perceptive. So the question then becomes, where are you today? Are you outside still wondering whether or not to come in? Are you still churned up about something? Is there a, is there a barrier in the way? Is there something that you need to deal with or you need to take to God in prayer? Or maybe you need to put in his hands because you can't bear it any longer Will you allow God to come and heal your hurt and your pain? You know, will you turn from the path that you're on and, and choose Jesus and choose life and, and come and sit at the table and join the party? Will you ask God to rescue you from the hell you might be experiencing today? You know, Jesus, he speaks words of love and mercy and grace to you and he invites you in. Or are you a Christian who judges others? And is always complaining and is always grumbling and is always blaming others, as C.S. Lewis puts it. And actually, you know, I believe, and, and this will sound very strong, but Jesus would warn you severely about hell today. And then he'd invite you in as well. He'd invite you to repent. Augustine, a North African theologian and church leader, um, he said this. He said, you've made us for yourself, O Lord. And our soul is restless until it finds its rest in you. God doesn't want us to be restless. He doesn't want our hearts to be restless. He doesn't want our hearts to be in torment. He doesn't want us to be feeling distant from him and far from home. But he wants us to know what it is to be part of a loving, eternal family and to be with them for all eternity. He welcomes us into the banquet. And he asks us to follow Jesus, 
Let's pray. Holy Spirit, as we just each pause now, we just ask you to come and to fill our homes with your presence and your power and your peace. And, and, and Father God, we thank you for Jesus. Um, God, we thank you that without him there's no hope and yet in him there is life and life in all its fullness and there is heaven and there is an eternity with you and God, that is more glorious than anything we ever could deserve and yet God, you give it to us as a free gift and Father, we thank you and, and Jesus, today we pray you'd continue to uproot the seeds of hell that might be in our hearts and we pray you continue to work in us and Lord, that you transform us into the image of your son, because Lord, that is, we need that. You know, we need that more than anything. Thank you, Lord, that you'll do that work. And God, I just pray for anybody who is listening in today and is thinking, I don't know where I stand and I'm not sure I can come in. And, um, and, and God, I pray they'd know that you're a father who's actually pleading with them to come inside. You know, it doesn't matter where they've been. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter where they've come from. Um, Father, you are just, you're just looking to just pull them in. And you won't do that against their will. Um, but uh, Father, you're just waiting to embrace them. And, and so again, Holy Spirit, today I pray you break through in their lives and their hearts. Um, and, and if that's you today and you're thinking, I want to come in, then just say, Jesus, I choose you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, do what only you can do. You know, Father, forgive me for my sins. I don't want to be in this place anymore. I want you more than anything. And do you know what? That Father, he will embrace you. And he's not going to let you go. He's never going to let you go. Uh, he's going to make you new. And he's going he's to, that, that, that new creation, it starts now. It starts right here. It starts right now in your life. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, um, just as we come to respond this morning, um, you know, the, um, the prayer team are, are there. They are they're waiting to pray with you in the, in the Zoom uh, prayer room. So you can go and you can join them and the link is there. If you want anything praying through, it doesn't have to be to do with a sermon. Um, it could be something you need um, healing for in your life. It could be a specific prayer request, but it might be that you just really need to pray with someone today. And so don't miss out on that opportunity. Um, go and join there. Also, if you have um, through today's sermon or any other stage decided that you want to follow Jesus and you want to put your trust in him. And, and it's a strange time to do that because we're all a bit disconnected from each other. But um, we want to send you um, some resources, including this magazine, Hope. Um, it, it's, been, um, it's been put out by the Good News Society. It's got loads of amazing verses of Psalms, John's Gospels there in the back. And we want to send you a few other things too. So if you want to receive that, and you, um, and you, you know, as I say, you put your faith in Jesus today or at some point over these past few months that it's been now, um, just message in the number in the corner, maybe just with your email address. That's all we need. And we'll get in touch with you and we'll send that stuff to you and, um, and we'll, we'll try and get you connected um, with us more. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to respond now, aren't we, Barry? Maybe you could just introduce this song and, um, and let's, just, um, let's just praise our God. We're going to sing a song called Living Hope. It may be a new song to a number of people. But it describes so well this fact that there are things that sit between us and God. But God is just there with his mercy just to call us in to break all those chains to set us free and to be our living hope how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I 
turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those words in Scripture in 1 Peter that says, Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a living hope through um, his Son who is resurrected from the dead and an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Thank you Mm -hmm. that the work has finished. It's completed. It's been Mm -hmm. done by Jesus. It's been won by him. And so, Lord, we stand today forgiven, set free, Lord God, free from condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this new creation that we are a part of. And Lord, uh, that glorious rescue, 
that glorious rescue that you stepped down from heaven to wear our sin and bear our shame so that we can be part of a new creation and wear those robes of righteousness. And so, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters today that we will learn how to walk in that, Lord, and to walk confidently and boldly. And Lord, that we will be able to share this amazing good news mm. with others, Lord God, in our community, that this will be a time of salvation for many people right across Ashford, right across the UK, right across the world. Mm. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, you know, thank you for those who've just been messaging in as well. Uh, we will read those. Um, there might be some testimonies there that we can put up on our Facebook page. And also um, do check out the YouTube channel. There's going to be some little follow-ups from the last two weeks' questions um, there, some shorter videos tackling some more specific questions that people have been asking. And so, um, so check those out. Uh, but we, we just hope that you'll be able to connect with us um, either via our Facebook page or subscribe to the YouTube channel. Keep in touch. We'd love to hear from you. We love the fact you've been able to join us this morning. And, um, and we pray that God would bless you. Um, he bless you abundantly, um, that you may know his presence in your life this week as you walk and you follow Jesus. And, um, and we look forward to connecting with you soon, maybe at the well, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday morning, if you're available, come and join us there. But for now, we're going to play out again um, with Jackson and his friends uh, for you to enjoy. And we'll see you uh, very soon. Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome to church. God bless you. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. 